Hey everyone, so One Piece chapter 1055 just came out, and this was a fantastic chapter. I loved two, two significant parts of this chapter, but I'm going to talk about the first and my personal favorite right off the bat, which is the huge, huge, huge lore reveal that we just got about Wano, the ancient weapons, and what this means for the rest of the world. Okay, so for me, for the longest time, it was very frustrating hearing this, this mantra over and over again. Open the borders of Wano country. Open the borders of Wano country. I won't say it was frustrating for the first part of it, but I think when I realized that Momonosuke has just landed on the idea that, hey, we're not going to open the borders of Wano country, with Momonosuke himself not really even knowing what that means, I don't believe that Momonosuke knows that opening the borders of Wano country means actually destroying the boundaries around Wano and essentially letting free the ancient weapon Pluton, Momono Momonosuke has no idea about any of that. So when he declared, okay, we're not opening the borders of Wano country, he doesn't have any context, the reader has no context. At that point in time, it was a little frustrating for me because this was the whole goal really that we began with. This was what all the scabbards chanted in unison back in Zo when they first explained like this is Odin's true final will, which is free Wano and open the borders, right? That was the final final goal that was kind of set at the beginning of this whole storyline. So, no, it does not sound like we're opening the borders just yet, but now we finally understand what that means. And I felt like that was a, a big missing piece, at least for me, over the course of this Wano arc. I just wanted to know what does that final goal that was spelled out for us at the beginning really, really mean? And I thought the answer that we got was well worth the wait and the mystery. Because it ties so many things together, and it kind of goes to show just how far back Oda may have been planning this, because what does the actual structure of Wano, what is this reminiscent of? Easily, without question, it's Water 7, right? This is Water 7 all over again, right? Water 7, same island geographical setup of Wano just before Wano. You've got an island, right, that's built on multiple levels, and for a long time people lived on the lower levels, but due to certain natural disasters, natural calamities, the way things worked, people had to start raising up uh, to the higher level and start living there and abandon the lower levels to basically be submerged underwater. And that becomes the old city versus the new city. So if you go back and look at Water 7, that's a lot of the language that we're getting there as well. The idea of the old city below and the new city that they're building up towards at the top. So turns out that Wano is the exact same setup. And on top of that, what was the main topic of discussion over the course of Water 7? It was Pluton. Pluton was what the world government was there looking for. And finally, we get to Wano, and we find out that Pluton is here, buried in Wano, just at the lower levels that have been submerged. So you can, like, I'm not going to say that Oda definitely had everything in mind, you know, from the beginning, but there's something there. At the very least, it's a re at the very, very bare minimum, this is a really, really cool, well thought out callback that the island structure of Wano parallels Water 7 pretty much to a T, and the main object of interest at both of those islands is the exact same thing, with Water 7 being the blueprints to create a Pluton, and Wano, the topic of discussion, being the actual Pluton itself. So, I don't know. That was just really, really cool to me. I love that. Um, I don't know how long Oda's been thinking about that. I don't know if he was thinking, you know, Wano first, then Water... I don't know. None of that really matters, I guess, at the end of the day. I'm just excited for what this means for the end game, which means at the end game, something's gonna happen, right? We're gonna get the borders being taken down, Pluton's gonna be let out, hell will be unleashed on the world. The question is, who's really gonna be doing it, right? Like this raises a whole a, like whole new avenue of possibilities. Who's gonna be destroying the borders? Is it gonna be is the world government gonna be able to come through and destroy the borders? I don't think so. Is it gonna be done by the people of Wano themselves? And so are the Straw Hat crew and the Alliance gonna be getting to run around with Pluton? That would be really, really cool to see. Uh, if you know my... The big theory that I've talked about, which is not really my theory, although I added a lot of my own pieces and personal thoughts and speculations to it, on the end of One Piece, that's a video I suggest you guys go check out after this. Um, it does talk a lot about how Pluton is likely essential to many of the endgame pieces that are set up for One Piece in general, and the creation of One Piece. So definitely check that out after this video, but yeah, there's just so much to speculate on from here on out. So. Really exciting stuff. It also changes a lot of what we initially thought about Wano, which is that, uh, you know, the continent puller idea, which I still think is really, really interesting, but it just doesn't seem like it makes sense at this point, right? So on the mainland of Wano, at least the mainland of Wano that we know as we know it right now, we've got the five separate, or sorry, six separate, you know, structures, like uh, islands that make up. Five, sorry, five. 
Six? I gotta look at the map again. Sorry, but I'm pretty sure it's five. I'm not gonna bore you guys. So, the five, five main islands that have, uh, you know, differing weather patterns and everything like that, and they clearly seem sort of pieced together, like a turtle shell in a way. So they've got the little rivers and everything running in between. And then you've got this mysterious skull, you know, a little bit away, which we call Onigashima. So for a long time, the running theory was that Wano was built from the connecting of many islands by a previous continent puller, perhaps Orz's father, grandfather, ancestor, something like that, right? At this point, it doesn't really seem like that can make sense as far as what we know now about Wano's structure. But it does raise the question then, okay, so why then? are all of these little islands having different, you know, differing weather patterns, because what we were told early in the Grand Line is that's not possible, really. Each island is a summer island, winter island, fall island, etc. But Wano is this curious case with an amalgamation of many, many different islands. And at the same time, why then is the Onigashima skull there? What did Marco hint at it being called back in the day? Because Marco did initially say that Onigashima, that's a strange name, I'm surprised that they're calling it that now. So. Some interesting, really interesting, so many interesting question marks came out of this. I think that was one of my favorite lore drops that we've gotten in some time. Um, in a weird way, I like it even more than the Nika stuff, I think, just because this feels to me like it's... Uh, maybe I'm just really biased because I love the Water 7 callback. I just really like the Water 7 callback and the connection there, and... Uh, I don't know, it just felt like a blast from the past or something along those lines. But this was one of... Wano's had a lot of great, great, great lore drops. I think this stacks up there is one of my favorites, so... Really, really great first part of the chapter right there. Let's talk a little bit about Green Bull. Green Bull, what to say about this man? He was really brought in to... Like, I'm not... Okay. On the one hand, I think Green Bull's introductory feat, whatever you want to call it, is probably the most impressive introductory feat I think any character has done in the series. I might be wrong on that. It depends how you want to stack it, but coming in and taking out two commanders like it's nothing... That's pretty crazy, right? That's pretty, pretty crazy. That's extremely impressive. Um, I think that's one of the most blatant examples we've ever had of uh, of just Oda quickly and clearly establishing, like, no, this character is definitely, definitely stronger than these two other strong characters that you've seen before. Oda usually doesn't really do that. I think lots of times when he introduces characters, he'll try not to make too many other characters, I guess, look bad in the fallout of it, if that makes sense. Um, but this was definitely... Not a case like that. This was, I think, Green Bull's introduction in 1053 was one of the most exciting character introductions we've ever had. Since then, I think his, uh, <laughs> let's just say his dialogue and demeanor has been a little bit, um, you know, like one of those tough guy henchmen that, that, you know, kind of ultimately gets put in their place a little bit. It's been a little bit like that. Um... I do think that, at the very least, one, it's interesting that, okay, the Scabbards, who all know Ryo, right, so they all know Ryo, they all know advanced armament hockey, even then, they're not able to cut his actual body. That's pretty interesting, because, you know, as we know with Logia, is obviously, even though he's in, in tree form, nature form, whatever you want to call it, they should be able to cut his actual body, but at the same time, I guess that, that raises the sort of discussion, okay, like, how much of that is his actual body, what constitutes his actual body, versus how much of that is just trees that he's manipulating. So, it does seem like he has a really powerful ability, right? To be able to deal with this many characters that are fairly, you know, the Scabbards, they've got a wide range of strength, I would say, but some of these guys, you know, uh, Inarashi, Nakamamushi, they can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Jack, right? So, Yonko Commander. So, um, it is a pretty impressive feat what he's doing right now. I think it's more so the way things are sort of portrayed as things move along with him being used as a bit of a punching bag from Momonosuke sh uh, showing off his power. And then Shanks a little bit afterwards, and this specifically the type of reaction he had to Shanks. Well, let's talk about Momonosuke first, okay? So to begin with, I thought that this was a great moment for Momonosuke. I would have loved to have seen this during the war, but I'm glad that Oda has not forgotten this aspect of his character, which is that over the course of not just Act 1, not just Act 2, but going all the way back to freaking Zo, Momonosuke's whole, at his core, what he has wanted to do, truly, truly wanted to do, is be able to participate in the battle and be an active force who can actually fight and defend. And that was one of the first things that he t spoke to Luffy about all the way back in Zo. That his frustration is not just that he, not just that he doesn't feel adequate yet as a leader or whatever, but that he wants to be able to fight and protect his own scabbards. He wants to be able to fight and participate in the upcoming battle. He doesn't want to just be a figurehead. Over Act One and Act Two, he's training. He really, really, really wants to fight. None of that was really 
focused on over the course of Act 3 because that wasn't his role there. But I really like that now, finally, if you go back and read this chapter and go compare it to chapter 800, like, 18 or 17 or something like that, when Momonosuke explains to Luffy, like, I want to do all of these things, but I cannot because I'm still too small. Now he's big. Now he's got access to one of the most powerful devil fruits in the world, Kaido's dragon fruit. And now he feels like, okay, Straw Hat Luffy, all of these guys have helped me out. Now it's my turn to be able to take care of myself. I should be able to protect these scabbards like I've wanted to do. I'm big now. There's no excuse. And he does it. And I think that that's uh, like Momonosuke has had, had by far the most character focus and development out of any of these characters over the course of the Wano arc. He's had the lion's share of that, but I'm happy to see that even the parts of his character that still needed some filling out and still needed some, some development to close off some loops, even those are still being closed off up till this point, even post battle with Kaido. So this was kind of the last piece I would say that Momonosuke was kind of looking for, or at least, at least that I was looking for with his character that he steps up and closes up those loops that were introduced all the way back in Zo that were running throughout Act 1 and Act 2, because the development that he got in Act 3 was, was good for the most part, in my opinion. I thought it was the best out of any character in Wano, but it didn't fully address a lot of the things that were set up for him beforehand, and I think this chapter really, really does that very well. So, Momonosuke's Borobrets, he actually, it's funny, he starts spamming those, which Kaido never did for whatever reason, but Momonosuke does, and, um, you know, say what you will, Green Bull recovered from that just fine. I'm not going to use that as a knock against Green Bull, in my opinion. It is, you know, Borobrets are a strong attack in the grand scheme of things. And Momonosuke was, you know, using them <laughs> on rapid fire pretty much. I'm sure Green Bull would have wrapped up Momonosuke, no problem, after that. But then Shanks shows up. He doesn't show up, but he flexes. Even though this makes Green Bull look a little bit, a little bit bad, I would say he... Out of all of the Admiral introductions so far, you know, Aokiji, Kizaru, Akainu, Fujitora, Green Bull is the only one who kind of walks away from his introduction being used more so as a hype tool for somebody else, in this case Shanks, um, than really, like, the, the memory of him initially taking out King and Queen that has quickly essentially been overshadowed, right? I think this moment for Shanks very easily overshadows what King and would, in terms of my memory and my impression of Green Bull, what Green Bull did a couple chapters ago. And I have zero problem with that because Shanks is just, he's just the coolest guy. Like, <laughs> he's just, yeah, I mean, he's, Oda can't stop hyping this man. There's not been a single instance since, I, I guess since he showed up on Whitebeard's ship that Oda has introduced Shanks and had him have like an actual scene that has not made Shanks just look like the coolest dude in the One Piece universe. It's crazy. Shanks was just flexing his Conqueror's hockey and we've never seen something like this. We've seen characters obviously, obviously sense other characters hockey from far away, but this was a case where Conqueror's hockey was being used from very, very far away. He's not even on the same island. Green Bull is sitting pretty much at the center of Wano, literally the center of Wano. Shanks is not even on the island. He's flexing his Conqueror's hockey from so far away that Green Bull, it's still enough for him to be sent running home. I mean, we have not seen Conqueror's hockey be used in that manner ever in the series so far, right? It's one thing to walk up near characters and like knock everybody in the room out, do a display of force and everything like that, but it's another thing entirely to do what Shanks just did, which is just from literally more than the, the uh, radius of the island away, right? From outside the island, he's just flexing his Conqueror's hockey and it's, it's enough to intimidate an admiral. And, you know, you could say something like, well, Green Bull's really scared because it's the whole Red Hair Pirates crew. He doesn't want to deal with the whole crew. And I'm just like, yeah, you can say that. But to me, this chapter did say some things, which is just like, look, you can, you can say Green Bull was afraid of the whole Red Hair Pirates and not just Shanks. But from my perspective, what was just established about Green Bull, he views all of these other characters, anything like commanders, Beast Pirates commanders, all these commander level characters, the Scabbards, etc. He views them as basically fodder. He has zero respect for them. He doesn't think anything of them. Who did he say was the deterrent for him up till now? Kaido. He thinks nothing of Kaido's Beast Pirate crew and everything like that. He said the deterrent was Kaido. And who was really the, de the deterrent this chapter for him? It was Shanks flexing his Conqueror's hockey. So sure, he's got the red haired pirates and stuff with him, but I'm just saying, like, from everything we've seen of Green Bull so far, I don't think he thinks much about, you know, these lower figure characters and stuff. It does seem like 
this was a chapter that served to hype up, you know, Kaido posthumously. Well, maybe he's not dead, but, you know, Kaido post-defeat or whatever, and also to hype up Shanks quite a bit, at least in my opinion, at least from the reactions we got. I think it's a difficult case to make that Green Bull's legitimately worried about anyone on the red-haired pirates aside from Shanks, considering how Green Bull treated the Beast Pirates and how Green Bull's been treating the Scabbards. So that's just my take on it. Maybe that's controversial. I don't know. But I thought that this was a, <laughs> just Shanks' quotes between last chapter and in this chapter, and we're still getting hit with a couple flashbacks of Luffy and everything like that. I don't know. I thought it was a, excellent lore, lore drop at the beginning, one of my favorites in Wano, and just some amazing panels for Shanks towards the end. Uh, the expressions and everything when Shanks gets serious, it's like no other character in the story. So... Uh, I love this chapter, and uh, yeah, that's all for this week. I'll talk to you all later.